You know, one of the things that um, ultimately we do in our life, uh, as we pursue God's purpose for our life, God wants us to be conformed into the image of his son. And so that's what uh, Inspired Teen Ministries, ITM, is all about. Man, we are focused on, on building a fervent relationship with God, uh, committed relationships to other Christ like people and fellowship with Christ centered community, using our gifts for God's glory and sharing our story with one another. Man, that's what it means to be a Christian, to follow Jesus and be conformed into the image of his son. Uh, I'm Pastor Joel, and Pastor Micah is away today, and he's also investing in the next generation, taking our seniors from our school and investing in them. I'm thankful for a pastor that we have who is passionate about the faith of the next generation. Often I remind pastor, as we have uh, conversations about different things that we're doing in youth group, I say, what is, just to get my point across, right, I'm like, what is it, what is the faith of the next generation worth to you, Pastor Mike? And he's like, you're right, Pat. I'm just kidding. So, like, then I can, uh, from that platform, I can say pretty much whatever I want at that point. Uh, but, no, uh, I am the youth pastor here at West Florida, and I am honored and privileged to have that position and inspire this next generation to do those things, to walk like Jesus walked. Today, what I'd like to do is I would like to take you into some things that we've been studying uh, in youth group recently, we have been uh, have the awesome privilege of going through the book of Luke this year. Since January, we started in the book of Luke, and it was really cool because we ended our series in the book of Luke right at the, the, the crucifixion and the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension right around Easter time, so it was a really, really cool theme. We had an awesome couple of weeks, the past couple of weeks, going through the series in, in the book of Luke, but what I want us to do is I want us to take a couple lessons from the book of Luke today. I want to share those things with you and challenge you to have a little bit of perspective in your life. That's my challenge for you today. That's my goal today. Um, and so what I want us to see, first of all, in the book of Luke is there's a theme that's throughout it. You've got to understand that there, there were many lessons in youth group about this, but we got the theme across. It was this idea that, that Christ is setting up an upside down type of kingdom. A kingdom that is, is flipped upside down. Everything that you thought about what, what, uh, what wealth was, what riches were, what fame were, what things that really mattered, flip those things on their head, and Jesus is like, that's my kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. It's totally different than anything that you could ever imagine or think of. It is the kingdom of God. And so in this upside down kingdom, I want us to look at some lessons from Jesus some examples. We'll look at two examples in the book of Luke, and then we're going to go to a teaching of Jesus in the book of Revelation that we read just a moment ago uh, to the church of Laodicea. Today, I want us to gain some perspective in our lives, and we're going to look at these examples. Before we get started, I want you to understand that we, as a people, as a church, we are we're so blessed. We are so blessed, and when I say the word blessed, I really mean we are rich. We are rich. How many of you would identify as being rich? Okay, a couple people raised their hand because maybe they think about, they know where I'm going with this. No, I want you to understand that we are, honestly, we are rich. And the problem is we, we don't really understand that we are. We don't really know that we are. I mean, we have, we have so many blessings. As, as, American, as American Christians, American Christianity, we're blinded often about the wealth that we truly have. We said, well, well, Joel, we had a really bad day today. Oh, you had a bad day because you woke up in your hundred plus thousand dollar home and, and your coffee pot didn't work or something like that. And, and you drive your multi thousand dollar car to work and you have all these things that, and you, get, you have a job, by the way. You have a job that provides for you. And, and, and then you, you go home and maybe you got uh, some things just didn't go your way. And you're like, I had a bad day. I'm so, uh, uh, I'm not as blessed as you think I am, Pastor Joel. We have so many blessings in this life. I want you to understand, I, I looked up the statistic, and over a third, closer to 50% of the world lives on $2 a day. Did you know that? Close to 50% of the world lives on $2 a day. If I were to take $2 right now, and I were to take them and like throw them out in the crowd, probably none of you would move to go pick it up. You'd be like, don't let that dollar touch me. You know, like, that's just a dollar. What is that? You know, and, and we have to understand, we are so blessed and rich. And it's from this platform, this understanding, we gotta have that perspective. I know that we all have our different struggles and different, different things that we've got going on, but, but understand from this platform, we are very rich. But I want you to understand this about our riches. Our riches put us at a huge 
spiritual disadvantage. The comforts that this life brings to us, the comforts that we have in life, the entertainment can be qualified as riches. The, the friends that we have can be qualified as riches. The, the fame or the, the relationships that we have, we are so blessed. But the blessings of this comfortable life that we have put us at a huge spiritual disadvantage. Today we're going to look at a couple of different examples, and I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And we're going to see of the first example. You guys know him as the rich young ruler. You're familiar with this passage of scripture, I'm sure, the rich young ruler. Today, I want to call him the youthful yo-yo, all right? That's what we're going to call him, the youthful yo-yo. He made some mistakes, and we're going to look at him today. We're going to look at his example, and we're going to go to the next chapter, look at another example, and we're going to see the difference between the two. So Luke chapter number 18, look at verse number 18 with me. The Bible says this, and a certain ruler asked him, he's talking to Jesus here, saying, good master... What shall I do to inherit eternal life? See, this rich young ruler is very similar to you and me. We've just established that we are rich. We are blessed. We may not admit it. We may not identify as that, but we have so many blessings and comforts in this life. If you were to take what we have in this life and you put us in the position of this rich young ruler, man, we are so blessed, right? And we have, we, we would kind of identify more with this rich young ruler here. And he goes to God, and this is good, he goes to the good master, and he asks him a question, what may I do to inherit eternal life? And that's many of us. We come to church, we're we're seeking a word from God. Hey, speak to me today. Help, what is it that I need to inherit the kingdom of God? What must I do? What is it? And so he's seeking after God, which is what many of you are doing here today, here at church. You're seeking after God. And, And Jesus answers him this way. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. And what Jesus is trying to do is help the rich young ruler to establish that he is not good and he has sinned. This is how you inherit the kingdom of God. You must first establish you have a broken relationship with God the Father. And so that's what he's doing. He's saying no one is good but God. And the rich young ruler literally responds to him, oh yeah, me too. Oh, I'm also good. See, he's missing the point. He says, um, thou knowest the commandment, Jesus says, in verse number 20, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. And the rich young ruler, the youthful yo-yo, in verse number 21 says, and he said, all these I have kept from my, up, from my youth up. Oh yeah, I'm good too. Jesus is like, you're missing the point. You're a sinner. Okay, well, even if those things are true, Jesus is like, all right, all right. Let's take that for granted, but let's see. Verse number 22. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. Yet, uh, he says, see, see, oh, man, sorry. He says, lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute it unto the poor that thou might have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful. Read this next bit with me. It says here, For he was very rich. He was very rich. Our riches put us at a huge spiritual disadvantage. And Jesus even says this in the next verses. He says, and when Jesus saw this, uh, uh, that he was very sorrowful. He said, how hardly shall they that that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus looks at this youthful yo-yo as he walks away sorrowful, and I think Jesus just kind of bows his head and and shakes his head and and a little bit concerned, and he says, it's so hard for you, isn't it? It's so hard for you because you actually think that your riches are worth something. You actually think that your fame, your relationships, You actually think that the things that you're doing in this life are actually worth something, but Jesus wants you to understand they're worth nothing. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then just follow Jesus. Choose Jesus over everything. Jesus says it's so hard for you. And they that heard it, man, they hear Jesus and they're like, wow. Well, that rich young ruler, and he walked away because you told him to sell everything that he has. What about us? And look at verse number 26. And then they heard it, uh, when they that heard it said, 
Who then can be saved? Well, I'm, I'm rich, so to speak. Uh, who then can be saved if they have to give up everything that they have? And that's the kind of the point, right? We are all gone out of the way. We are all together become unprofitable. Jesus says, you, you're, you're a sinner, and you need someone to bridge the gap. And it's so hard for us to let go of this world and to claim Jesus. And that's what he says in the next verse, in verse number 27. And he said, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Our riches put us at a huge spiritual disadvantage because we actually think they're worth something. And what we need to do is we need, to, we need, to, um, we need a savior. We need someone to come in because the things that are impossible for us to let go of are possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. God can save the hopelessly rich and blinded people in this world. God can save me who is hopelessly blinded to, to the grace that comes from God. God can take us from a place of pride and self-sufficiency to a, a place of hope, a place of humble dependence on him. And there's hope in that. And so what I want us to understand is that our, our riches put us, first of all, at a huge spiritual disadvantage, but our riches are not too great for God. Our riches are not too great for God. If you go through the passage and, and you take your Bibles and you turn to the next chapter of Scripture, Jesus is walking into Jericho, and he meets there a man where, where this is the second example that we're going to look at today. It says in, in verse number 1 of chapter 19, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named, what was his name? Zacchaeus. Everyone is familiar, or most of us are familiar with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Today I want to call him the wee weasel, the wee little weasel. He was a tax collector, the Bible says, that he was a publican, and he was rich. Think of the, the sleaziest type Danny DeVito car salesman type guy that you can, okay? This is who he is. And this is the, um, uh, no shade on Danny DeVito, but the characters he plays sometimes are sleazy people, right? Okay, so, so you've got this, you've got this uh, guy who, who is rich. Look at the verse. It says in verse number two, Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was, what's the next word? Rich. He was rich. Verse number three, and he sought to see Jesus for who he was. And just like the rich young ruler came to Jesus, Zacchaeus He's seeking after Jesus. He's wanting a word from him. And, and so he's wanting to see this, this Jesus for who he was. And could not because of the press, because he was little of stature. Okay? And verse number four, it says this, And he ran before and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he, uh, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for this day I must abide at thy house. We go on to read in verse number six, and he, he made haste. See, this is the, the difference of response to Jesus' commands. And he made haste, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone, uh, that Jesus was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and he said unto the Lord, Behold, behold, Lord, the half of my goods, I will give it to the poor. And, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to thy house. For as much as he also is the son of Abraham, the son of, the son of man is come to seek and to save those that are lost. Jesus, in this passage of scripture, he saves the rich man. What is impossible with God, the passage of scripture just before this, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And this man, in his response to Jesus, he, he gives it all up. He says, I'll give it all away for you. I, I, will, I will restore, I will make amends. I, you know what, my pride doesn't matter. And I've, I've, I've wronged somebody, it doesn't matter. I'll make it up to them. I'll give it all away. Whatever it takes, Jesus, I will be on fire for you. I will follow you. The kingdom of heaven, see, Zacchaeus understood here that the kingdom of heaven was like a treasure that is hid in a field. He maybe wasn't there when Jesus taught this in the book of Luke, but, but he probably heard about it. That following Jesus or, or the kingdom of God 
Following after the kingdom of God is like a treasure that is hid in a field, where a man finds that treasure and sells all that he has so that he can buy that field and have that treasure. It's all in for Jesus. Jesus over everything. And take the world, but give me Jesus. See, today we have these two examples. We have the example of the youthful yo-yo who, who isn't willing to give up of this world to follow Jesus. And then we have the wee little weasel who says, you know what? I'll give it all up. It doesn't matter. I want Jesus above all else. I want this treasure you know, money, fame, comfort, stature, whatever it is, it does weird things to us. It brings to us a sense of security and self-sufficiency. The more that we have, the less that we think we need God. Our riches put us at a huge spiritual disadvantage. But our riches are not too great for God to I want to take you to one final passage of scripture today in the book of Revelation. This is from Jesus' teaching, and, and as you look at the, the teaching from Jesus to the church of the Laodiceans, you know, as I'm reading it, I see some very close parallels or some similarities to the church as a whole in America, and it kind of concerns me, and it could and it should concern you as well. Look at the passage of scripture uh, with me, and this is the example number three, the lukewarm Laodicean. See how this one was alliterated and I had to alliterate the other two, right? Okay, so, so lukewarm Laodiceans, we find them in Revelation chapter three, verse number 14. It says, and under the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This is Jesus Christ speaking to the church of Laodicea. And what does he say to them? He says, I know thy works and that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Basically what's going on here, I'm not gonna go into the, the big uh, historical context of what's going on at the church of Laodicea, but basically what you got to understand is at Laodicea, um, there was no natural water source. And so there was a hot spring nearby and a cold spring or a, a creek or something like that nearby. And so what they would do is they would build aqueducts or plumbing to get the water from the hot spring or the water from the cold spring, and they would bring it into the city. But over time, the water would sit still in these, in these aqueducts, in these, in these plumbing uh, this, the plumbing that they would have and bring it to the city. And over the time as it traveled down, it would get lukewarm, stagnant. And you know what happens to stagnant water? It gets disgusting, bacteria begins to grow in it. And Jesus is basically saying like, you're not useful to me. You're not hot water or you're not cold water from the spring or you're not hot water from the spring. And, and, and because you are lukewarm and you've been stagnant in your, in your faith, man, you're like bacteria infested water and you just make me sick. I want to spew you out of my mouth. It's so repulsive to me. It's useless to me. I can't use this. And he says, I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold, and you've become stagnant in your faith to him. And so he goes on to say, basically, you're, you're, you're not doing anything for me. You're not on fire for me, and, and it makes me want to gag. Verse number 17, he says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. There's that word rich again, right? And I'm comfortable. I, I like what I have. I have all that I need. You're rich and increased with goods, and you have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Oh, how blinded we are to our need for Jesus Christ because of our comforts. We get so blinded. And he goes on to say, I, I would counsel thee to buy of me Gold that is tried in the fire, things that are actually worth something, things that are tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the, thy shame and thy nakedness do not appear. Oh, how shameful it is to be a Christian who takes the name of Christ and bears it in vain and lives apathetic to God. Oh, how shameful it is. And you're taking Christ's name and you bear it in vain. And the Bible even says, I will not hold him guiltless who bears my name in vain. Oh, Christian, 
how shameful it is to, for you to bear the name of Christ in, in this way, in a vain way, and lukewarm and apathetic to God. He says, I want to clothe you in raiment that your shame and your nakedness do not appear and appoint thine eyes with eyes have so that you can see what is truly valuable, so that you can see that this life means nothing in the grand scheme of things. But you didn't come to me in your need. You didn't come to me and depend on God for your provision. We didn't go to God and say, God, give us this day our daily bread. How often do we pray before our meals and we ask God to bless us uh, and we thank God for something, honestly, that sometimes in our minds we're like, no, I put this food on the table. I did this work. I had to work hard for this. And we, we just kind of in a vain, repetition way don't mean, God, thank you for the provision that you've given to me today, the strength to be able to work, the, the blessings that you've brought to my life. My question today is, are you on fire for God? Are you on fire for God? Or maybe you're like the Laodiceans and you've become stagnant, you've become lukewarm, Greater fear than this is just being lukewarm. Greater fear is you say, yeah, Pastor Joel, I hear you. I've grown a little lukewarm in my life. I've grown lukewarm and, and I'm not really doing anything about it. I realize I'm not doing anything about it. Or even worse yet, you're lukewarm and you don't want to do anything about it. You say, I like where I am. I have a little bit of God. I got him on Sunday morning. I've got a little bit of God, and that's all I need. I have enough God. I, have, I need more riches. I need more status. I need more friends. I need more followers. I need more comforts in my life. That's what's truly going to satisfy me and make me happy. I'm lukewarm, Pastor Joel, and I'm loving it. I'm lukewarm, and I love it. Do you not understand what Jesus says here? Spew you out of my mouth. Make me sick. You make me want to gag that you would choose something so low as the provisions of this world or the comforts of this world, something that is worth nothing. You make me sick that you actually think that the things that you can bring into your life and your own power are actually worth something to you. Friends, you shouldn't do anything today until you get this figured out on how to be fire on fire for God. You shouldn't do anything, because honestly, if the God, your creator and king, says, I want you make me sick, and you're, you're displeasing me, and you are shaming my name, does anything else matter? The Sunday lunch that you have in the crock pot right now doesn't matter, because God says you make me sick with your apathy. You make me sick with your lukewarmness. Nothing else should matter. The God of the universe, my creator and my king, my relationship with him matters the most in my life. Don't do anything until you get this figured out on how to be fire for God. Why does God say this so harshly? Why is he so, uh, so hard with this church of Laodicea? And why has today kind of been a little bit like in your face? Because he says in verse number 19, I really want you to understand this from this perspective. In, Luke, or in, or in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 19, he says this. And as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. I love you. I love you too much to watch you go down this path, Jesus says. I, 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 I mean, I care so much about your faith and, and, and what really matters. And I want you to experience the joy that is found in following me. I love you too much to let you go down this path. And so he says in the end of the verse, in verse number 19, he says, Be zealous, therefore. Get on fire for God and, oh, repent. Repent of the apathy. God loves you. He's calling you out. And he wants us to live on fire for him. You know, I have, I have a haunting fear. I told the kids this the other day uh, in youth group. I have a haunting fear that one day, you know, I'll, at the end of time, I'll get to heaven and I'll be looking for you. I'll get to heaven and, and I'll, I'll be there and I'll be like, man, this is awesome. And I'll look for my church family. I'll look for you. And I'll run around, I'll be like, isn't this awesome? We made it. 
Man, I stood before God and he saw me and he didn't see my sin. I had done so many evil things, but because I was in Jesus, he saw Jesus Christ's righteousness instead of my sin. It was so awesome. I stood before him and he said, come into my, into, and dwell with me forever in heaven. Come because you are my son and whom I'm well pleased. What he said about Jesus, right? And, and so he, like, isn't that awesome? Didn't you experience that? And I'll look for you and I'll find you. And as soon as I do, man, I'm full of joy and passion. I'm like, this is awesome. And I look at you and you have a face of regret. You're hanging your head. Like, what? What's going on? This is awesome. Like, oh, I just, I wish I would have done more. I wish I would have, wouldn't have been so blinded by the comforts of that short time on earth. I think many of us will get to heaven and we'll feel that way. That's a haunting fear of mine, or even worse yet, I'll be full of joy. I'll be looking for you. Isn't this awesome? And I won't find you. You won't be there. Because you ultimately did not choose Jesus. And you didn't place your faith in him. It's a haunting fear of mine, mostly of my youth group. And as I was preparing for this message, I began to pray for you. I began to pray for you that you would, that God would open your eyes. That you would see what is truly valuable is a life that is lived for Jesus over everything. Say, what do I do, Pastor Joel? You know, it's hard. Because we have a sickness. It's called comfort. It's hard to get out of comfort. It's hard to get out of the complacency in our life. It's hard. I get it. It's so hard for you, Jesus says. But what is impossible for us is possible with God. And Jesus says this. You know what? In verse number 20, I bridged the gap. I made it possible for you. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on the throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Hey, listen up. This is your wake-up call. This is Jesus knocking on the door. Hear the words of God and oh, be zealous and repent. Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. If you overcome as he has overcome, you will be given greater riches than whatever you thought was valuable. You're not actually losing that much. You're giving up of this world and you're gaining the throne of God. And you'll be able to sit with him on that throne. Hey, if you have the throne, I don't need the world. Because I have, I have a relationship with God. I have, I have a home with him. If I get the throne, I don't want the world. You must choose Jesus over everything. And you will never experience more joy, more just overflow of the love of God in your life. You will never experience the true satisfaction tell you do this. You choose Jesus over everything. So today, what am I asking you to do? Number one, don't do nothing. Don't hear a message and walk away from here and be like, that was a good word. That was a good word. And then do nothing about it. Oh, Satan would love that. He would love you to be deceived enough to say, oh yeah, it was good, and walk away and not get on fire for him. I believe Satan loves it when churches are full of people who hear the word and they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, good, and they don't do anything about it. Oh, you're deceived, you're blind. You're doing Satan's job for him when you do that. So don't do nothing. Today, I want you to ask God a couple questions. God, reveal to me if there are any areas of my life where I'm lukewarm. Is there any area of my life where I'm lukewarm or I have not been on fire for you and I've kept this back from you and I've loved this more than you? Give me strength where I am weak because, God, I can't do this. It's impossible for me. You have to do this work for me. I have to pick you over everything and then you will begin to work the work that only you can do. And this last one, God, do whatever it takes. 
to get me on fire for God. Whatever it takes, that's a scary prayer, honestly. God, whatever it takes, I'm willing to give it up for you. I'm going to set it all aside. Whatever it takes, get me on fire for you because nothing else matters. I hate that my life has been repulsive to you. And God, I repent. Help me to get on fire for you and whatever it takes, whatever you need to take out of my life, whatever you need to take away, whatever, whatever trial you need to bring into my life to help me more like you, help me to be more like you, put me in that refining fire. Put me in that place so that I can be on fire for you. Whatever it takes, you gotta be bold to pray that prayer. Please help me to see that the treasure that is you is greater than anything that this world has to offer. Would you bow your heads? your eyes. Today I've given you three things that I, I want to challenge you to work on and to pray and to ask God for. God, would you show me anything in my life where I've not been on fire for you? Give me strength where I am weak because I can't do this without your power. Without your Holy Spirit power working in me, I can't do this. So God, do whatever it takes. I surrender to you Get me on fire for you because I realize that nothing else matters.